I'm here to tell you about analytics and how analytics is all around us each day and every day and how I believe analytics is going to revolutionize and change our lives in ways we never thought possible. So what are analytics? Where are analytics around us? Anyone on your cell phone? I saw an iPad back there. Anyone using a Google Click? They're getting analytics on you in terms of better searches. Anyone uh, looking at uh, Facebook? There's analytics there trying to connect you better with uh, other people. Uh, Target uses analytics to figure out how to better market and deliver services to you. And Netflix uses analytics to figure out what's my favorite movie and what should I be watching. Uh, so analytics is all around us, but why analytics now? So everyone hold up your smartphone. Those of you who have your phone, hold it up. You're looking at probably the, the single most <laughs> piece of technology that's responsible for this revolution for two reasons. One, more data has been collected in the past two or three years than all of human history combined. Think about that. We have more data than all of human history combined just from the last two or three years. Why? Any ideas? Your phones. You walk, you talk, location, where you go, etc. Right? That's the first piece. The second piece of good news, or bad news, depending on which way you look at it, is your smartphone has more computing power than all of NASA did in 1969 to send a, um, men to the moon. What are we doing with our smartphones? We're texting, we're blogging, we're Facebooking, right? It makes me happy, right? What are other people doing with that power? Google's out predicting the um, US Center for Disease Control and figuring out where the next flu outbreak's gonna be before they do. Target's figuring out when uh, father's teenage daughters are pregnant before uh, the father knows and sending them coupons for baby wipes, et cetera. And Netflix is trying to sell your preferences to the movie studios to figure out are we gonna cast Brad Pitt or um, some other competitor in the next favorite uh, movie. So analytics is all around us, but I want to prove the possible to you. And in order to prove the possible to you, I'm going to take you back, maybe way, way back, to one of the happiest times in your life. I'm going to take you back to your proverbial happy place. And you guys are going to remember it's called statistics class. Yes, even for me, it was painful. <laughs> what are statistics? Statistics, it's all about data. It's about averages. It's about regression to the mean. It's about the normal distribution. It's about things that happen in the past tend to shape things in the future. So let's go back to uh, Mathematics 101. Here we're going to look at the past on the horizontal axis, and something. It could be my happiness, could be my GPA, it could be anything. So, what we do is we collect data. Data shows up. We can take surveys writing data. We can figure out how many times you listen to, um, to your favorite song. That's data, etc. And so what do we do? We use the wonderful transformation of higher order mathematics that my seven-year-old can do, right? And we draw a straight line through the data, right? So this is technically called mumbo jumbo, right? Without the mathematics. So let me ask you, given this is our data, given our mathematical, we call this the OLS regression line, what would you predict is going to happen next year? What would you guys predict? Yes. Fantastic, A+, plus. you all tripled your portfolio in the stock market, and you're all very, very rich. Now, this is very, very simple. What are companies doing, though? They're not just taking one signal, they're taking multiple signals. So think about the last time uh, you spent probably three hours on customer service with either your bank or your airline, 
and you were trying to figure out where did my money go, can I get a refund, and why I'm not happy. So the limits of this are to figure out we just don't want one piece of data, but we're going to have multiple pieces of data, right? So what companies are doing are figuring out, great, how much did you pay for the service in terms of customer relationship management? How long did you wait on hold? How good or bad was your experience with the uh, customer service representative? And finally, and probably mo most importantly, um, how much did you like the old 90s elevator music while you're on hold? So, what this is going to take us into, though, is the realm of big data. That was 30, 40 years ago. Uh, anyone know what Moore's Law is? Anyone know? Moore's Law, over 43 years ago, or sorry, 45 years ago, stated that process, computer processing power will double every 18 months to two years. And so within the last 48 years, computer processing power has increased by, anyone take a guess, 1,000 times. Think about it, 1,000 times. That's why NASA had buildings in 1969. You have your iPhone or you have your Google phone today. So, we run around, we have more power, more computing power, more technology, the ability to grab more and more data, more and more signals, and this is what we call big data. Now, big data, besides being a fancy term for consultants to walk around and make a lot of money, is composed of four things. One, volume of data. So instead of having annual reports over the last five years, we have millions, if not billions of records. Geolocation records, where we went today, right? The velocity, the second V of data, has changed. So instead of getting a report every day, every month, we have these billions and billions of records thrown at us faster than we can ever humanly process. So very, very difficult. The third V of big data is variety. We have data not just from our annual reports, we have data not just from GDP per capita, we have data not just from unemployment, but we have data from my Nike uh, Fitbit. I'm not wearing one, right? We have data from our social tweets, our social texts, in terms of our moods, our sentiments, et cetera. So, this new frontier, how does all this data help us? Well, let's go to, remember the past? We only had limited data, it wasn't big, right? But now we have new signals from different places coming faster and faster in real time. So when we actually want to predict the future, no, 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 we forgot about the Facebook tweet, it gives us a very different prediction, right? And instead of making the old predictions, we can make new predictions. This is how Google can outpredict the US government and the Center of Disease Control. This is how Target can outpredict your uh, local concierge, right, who knows intimately uh, their customers' preferences. So, where do we go from here? Our st so this is all statistical, but anyone remember some of the limits of statistics? My favorite one, anytime anyone wants to invest is, and you hear it all the time, you know, come invest your money on this, 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 and that, and it says, past performance is not indicative of future behavior. And it's like, what did they say? <laughs> past performance is not indicative of future results. Why, why do statistics break down? For several reasons. One, the world is not simple, it's not linear. It's linear for me to solve the equation, because it was very easy, right? But it's complex, number one. Number two, we become aware of our theories, don't we, as human beings? Human beings are wonderful, they're terrible, they're fantastic at going out in the world and really messing stuff up, for better or worse from the depths of the sublime, from beauty, from art, from everything. So where do we go from here? What are the next steps? So we're gonna go from the statistical into what we're gonna call the behavioral. And what is behavioral? 
So it's not really tops down, it's not really, you know, we're subject to the past and past data, but it's all about answering the question that we've always been trying to answer, how does X cause Y? Now, this is no different than everything you learned in kindergarten. How to act, react, and interact, and play nicely with the other children, right? But of course, we're scientists, we're academics, we're researchers, we're executives, we're policy makers. We need to monetize this, so we're gonna make it super complicated, right? That's what we do. So, what if I take this clicker and I throw it into the audience and it hits this fellow right here? What's going to happen? Take a guess. He's gonna throw it back. Great. What if I throw it and it misses and it hits this fellow over here instead? Maybe he throws it back. Well, what happens if I throw it, it hits this fellow, it bounces off this fellow, and all 3.2 ounces of ferocious flying soft plastic at five feet per second give this gentleman a tremendous concussion. Sorry. <laughs> What's going to happen? He's going to sue me. Right? He's going to sue me. He's going to be upset. And now we have these pathways of behavior, these pathways of causation. Well, what's going to happen is probably the TED Talk's going to get more uh, viewership be just for sheer entertainment value, and I'm going to exit stage left, right? So there are thousands of scientists, not just me, who have been doing behavioral modeling for 50 or 60 years in economics, in finance, in political science, in psychology, all across the social science domains. And so what do we do is, like engineers, we put together the various pieces, the components, the X's, the Y's, the A, B, C, D's, and use different portions of theory, different models, different mathematical techniques to put together different products. Someday people want a cell phone, other day people want a car, and we need to know what are the right things that go in there. So, this all sounds good, this all sounds wonderful, um, however, consultants will tell you it's complicated. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, that's how they make money, right? I'm going to tell you, though, it's more about complexity. So, we know complexity is all around us. Um, anyone have any idea of how much economic value we lost in the 2007 to 2009 global economic crisis? Take a wild guess. The U.S. Fed Reserve Board, are they conservative or liberal in their estimates? What do you guys think? Estimates that we lost somewhere close to $12 trillion of economic value. Wow, there's a lot of money. That translates into about $100,000 of debt for every U.S. household. Now, if you don't think of financial crisis in California and New York can affect stuff in China and can affect things back here, you're asleep. Give me your $100,000 and stay asleep, right? <laughs> so let me show you notionally, conceptually, how we can take complexity, how we can take all these behavioral theories and put them together in Y. So here, just think about individuals. The links are these X's, the Y's, the complex theory. Right? Here, this is a very simple theory. It's called preferential attachment theory. It's behavioral theory. And as we can see, as it's not just me throwing the clicker, it's everyone throwing the clicker everywhere. And we can begin to map and track and anticipate individual behavior into collective behavior into societal behavior. And so we can see structure emerging. We can see patterns that we could never see before that I could not do as an individual because I'm still stuck figuring out what two plus two is, <laughs> right? This allows us to go beyond why, why are computers your best friends? Because they can do repetitive tasks over and over and over and over again. So in those networks that we just saw, 
If we think about, we started off with one, two, three people. If you think about the number of individuals, how complex do the interactions get as you go up? Remember, n factorial, it's for five, it's 120 possible combinations. For six, it's seven, uh, 725, and it goes up and up. Well, what about, what was the combination's antibody permutations, right? How are permutations different? Because it had to be all separate, individual, and unique, right? Wow, it just gets bigger and bigger. For, so for six people in a social setting, there are over 32,000 possible influence networks of who could influence whom, why, and how, just given a simple X causes Y. Wow. That's crazy, right? I just can't keep that in my head. So what do we do? We use computers. And we take the statistical, and we take the behavioral, and we fuse it together in something called the predictive. So remember our big data here? We had past, future, and we're going to make our prediction. Well, what happens when people come in? We're aware of our theories. I know I'm going to be tested. I know I'm going to be held accountable to the board next week that I didn't hit my targets, right? Well, what do people do? We come in and we mess stuff up for better or for worse. What does the messing stuff up do? It actually changes how we create the future, how we predict the future, given human, social, cultural, financial, and economic uncertainty. So. This type of modeling I've been doing over 20 years, been fusing behavioral theories from mathematics, from economics, from finance, from political science and sociology, as I said, like engineers on a circuit board, to anticipate everything from the Arab Spring revolutions to forecasting thousands of political, economic, social events over the last 10 years at over 85% accurate, to helping executives shape strategy on mergers, acquisitions, joint ventures, litigations, all using either statistical, smaller big data, behavioral types of models, and fusing the two together. So we have best in class both. So this is the next frontier of analytics. This is where the Googles have the data and the Center for Disease Control, they have the scientists and the theories and the brains. As these things to emerge, look out. For better or for worse, technology is value neutral and it's all about how we apply it, but a lot, a lot of insights are going to be created. It's our responsibility as human beings to use that for better or for worse. Not technology, our responsibility. So, I want to leave you with one of my favorite science fiction writers. Sir Arthur C. Clarke, uh, famous science fiction writer, literary uh, genius. In, I believe it was 1949, he envisioned satellite communications. In 1953, he envisioned the internet and cell phones and GPS on your cell phones to get you to and fro. 1953. And in 1974, he envisioned online banking and online shopping. Pretty cool fellow. So when we think about what's possible, we should listen to him. He has three laws of prediction in science. And as you guys leave today, I want you to think about these three laws, and I want you to filter things you see vis-a-vis -vis these three laws. Law number one. If an elderly and distinguished scientist tells you something can, can be done, he or she is most certainly right. If an elderly and distinguished scientist tells you something cannot be done, he or she is most certainly wrong. Why? Do you want your grandparents or do you want teenagers fixing the Wi-Fi at home? It's technology. <laughs> it moves quickly, right? Law number one. Law number two, remember this. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Everyone hold your phone up. 
Everyone hold your phone and everyone hold your car keys. Excellent. Those of you, keep your, keep your phones up. Those of you who are holding your phones, do you know what a fractal antenna is? Anyone know what a fractal antenna is? No? You all have them in your phones. If you don't know, pass your phones to me. There will be a sale at the end of the talk. Now, double or nothing, let's go for the car keys. Everyone hold up their car keys. Excellent. Anyone know what a hall sensor is? Anyone? I'm opening a car dealership in the moment I leave here. A hall sensor measures the timing and speed of your engine to communicate between the speed of the wheels and the combustion and the sparks on the ignition timing. Why don't you guys know about that? Do you need to know about it? It's magic. <laughs> but you all drove here today, and you all talked on the phone while you were driving over, right? The last piece I want to leave you with from Sir Arthur C. Clarke is the only way to understand what's possible is to venture a little bit into the impossible. So that's why I stand before you today looking forward of how we will all venture into the impossible together to see what we can create. Thank you so much.